recording for this meeting has begun. Greetings, everyone. Good day, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. On behalf of Feed the Future and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I welcome you to our webinar, Bees, Bats, and Butterflies, the Importance of Pollinators for Global Food Security and Nutrition. I am your host and Friendly Neighborhood Senior Knowledge Management Advisor, Zachary Baquet, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, who's your hosting today's webinar. I will facilitate today's webinar, so you will hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer period. Before we dive into the content, let us take a moment to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, ask questions, and share resources. It's a great way to connect and have conversations um, for this presentation. We will collect your questions from the chat box throughout the webinar. We will have our Q&A after the presenters have spoken. To enlarge your screen, you can click on the arrows in the upper right of your screen. This will make the presentation larger. You can click on the arrows again to shrink it back to normal. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these resources on agrilinks.org. Thank you for your attention. Now onwards to our presentations and discussions for today's webinar, Bees, Bats, and Butterflies, the Importance of Pollinators for Global Food Security and Nutrition. Let me introduce Kate Gallagher, an American Association for Advancement of Science and Science of Science, Science and Technology Policy Fellow, uh, more for short, AAAS Fellow. Uh, at USAID. A pollina pollination ecologist by training, Kate is applying her scientific and technical skills to support the implementation of USAID's environmental and natural resource management framework with the goal of building capacity and fostering networks of innovation and information exchanges to better integrate environment and natural resource management across development sectors. Kate will introduce the session and the speakers. I hand it over to you, Kate. the stage for our conversation. I will also like to thank our three distinguished speakers for being with us today. At USAID, we coordinate the Feed, to, the Feed the Future initiative, which seeks to achieve the goals of the U.S. government global food security strategy to reduce hunger, poverty, and malnutrition. Where do pollinators, including bees, bats, butterflies, beetles, birds, and many other species, fit into this ambitious agenda? Today we will explore how these humble species contribute to global food security and nutrition, and highlight research from our colleagues on how agricultural and land management activities can safeguard pollination services. Globally, more than 70% of food crops benefit from pollinators. Even when crops have the ability to self-pollinate, wild pollinators often increase crop yield, nutritional quality, and shelf life. Pollinator-dependent crops are among the most nutritious. They include fruits, vegetables, nuts, and oils, which are major sources of micronutrients in the human diet. Global agriculture's dependence on pollinators is growing. Over the past five decades, the proportion of total agricultural production that benefits from pollinators has increased fourfold, compared with only a twofold increase among crops that do not require pollinators, such as wheat, maize, or rice. Pollinators contribute to agriculture-led growth, economic growth. The value of crops that depend on pollinators is five times higher than crops that do not. High-value, pollinator-dependent crops like coffee and cocoa contribute significantly to developing economies and provide employment and income for millions of people. For smallholder farmers, a major focus of our work here at USAID, enhancing native wild pollinator density and diversity has been directly linked with improved crop yields. Lastly. Pollinators contribute to the ecological resilience of farming systems. The com combined actions of different pollinators visiting flowers at dif in different parts of the plant, at different times of the day or year, under different weather conditions, ensures more stable crop yields and protection against declines in any single pollinator species. And this may become increasingly important as the climate changes. 
Understanding the contributions of pollinators to food security and nutrition is particularly important because some studies show that pollinators are declining in diversity and abundance globally. These declines have been attributed to several interacting threats, including habitat loss, climate change, invasive species, as well as pests and pathogens. Importantly, declines in pollinator populations are expected to limit the provision of pollination services and have spurred increased international and national attention on their role in food security, led domestically by colleagues at the United States Department of Agriculture. Here at USAID, we recently published a report discussing the importance of wild pollinators for food security and nutrition, which can be found in the links pod and file download pod along with the slides for this webinar. Over the past month, AgriLinks contributors from around the world have shared their knowledge and expertise on this critical issue, and we are thrilled to crap, cap off our Pollinator Month by discussing this issue today with three leading scientists who will help us understand how we can work together to conserve pollinators in our agricultural landscapes and ensure the long-term sustainability of food systems. Our first speaker is Dr. Claire Cremen. Claire is the President's Excellence Chair in Biodiversity and Professor at the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. She is an ecologist and applied conservation biologist working on how to reconcile agricultural land use with biodiversity conservation. Before coming to UBC, she held faculty appointments first at Princeton University and then at the University of California, Berkeley, where she was also founding faculty director for the Center of Diversified Farming Systems and the Berkeley Food Institute. Claire was also recently named this year's laureate for, of the Volvo Environment Prize for her world-class research research on how humanity can feed itself while protecting biodiversity. So congratulations to Claire. Our second speaker is Dr. Smitha Krishnan. Smitha joined the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT in 2019 as an expert in agrobiodiversity and ecosystem services. She is based in Bangalore, India, and her research interests broadly include ecosystem services, pollination biology, plant-animal interactions, restoration, soil-plant relationships, and sustainable livelihoods. Prior to joining Biodiversity International, Smitha worked for the Ashoka Trust for Research in, in Ecology and Environment, a non-governmental research institution based in Bangalore, India, and ETH Zurich. Our final speaker is Dr. Taylor Ricketts who serves both as the Gund Professor and Director of the Gund Institute for Environment at the University of Vermont. Taylor's research centers on the overarching question, how do we meet the needs of people and nature in an increasingly crowded, changing world? Before arriving at UVM in 2011, Taylor led the World Wildlife Fund's Conservation Science Program for nine years. Notably, just a week ago, Taylor was elected as a AAAS Fellow. Uh, for distinguished contributions to the field of ecology and conservation, particularly for quantifying ecosystem services and using that understanding to inform management efforts. So as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow, I'd like to offer my warm congratulations from one AAAS Fellow to another. And now I will hand it over to Claire for our first presentation. Hello, everyone, and thank you to USAID for organizing this um, important webinar. Uh, I'm pleased, really pleased to be here. And as Kate has very, um, very well summarized uh, the importance of pollinators for our, our food production, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started on talking about who are our pollinators. And so I think everybody knows about the honeybee. And this is a, a species that's revered around the world. Uh, and this is a very important crop pollinator because we manage this species for production. And the reason is, as a social species that is semi-domesticated, we can actually take it and put it where we want it in crop fields. And in some places, like in the United States and in South Africa, for example, um, this, uh, we move um, many, many colonies, even millions of colonies around uh, to provide these pollination services on large fields. But we have lots of other species that are involved in pollination, um, many different insect groups, as well as some mammals and birds, uh, like hummingbirds and bats. Uh, our bee species are particularly important in pollination. So in addition to that honeybee, there are 20,000 other bee species around the world. 
And of those, about 13% visit crops. And it's a fairly recent finding that we now know from studies around the world that about 50% of the economic value of crop pollination actually comes from these wild, unmanaged pollinators and not the honeybee. So we really need not just the managed honeybee, but other species, wild species, in our environment to give us this critical pollination service. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. What is so important about other species? This is, this examples come from my own work uh, focusing on native bees. So um, the, when a bee community is diverse and abundant, it can actually substitute for the honeybee entirely and provide that insurance policy that um, Kate was talking about. Uh, but interestingly also, because of interactions between honeybees and, and uh, our native bee species, the native bee species can change the way that honeybees work and actually make them better pollinators. And so we can actually get a doubling of production when we have the combined effects of both honeybees and native bees for crops like sunflower, almond, and others. And in some cases, uh, like in the case of tomato, blueberry, and some other crops, the honeybees are not very effective pollinators. They're not very able to work the, the crop flower. And so in that case, our native bees are much better pollinators. And then finally, we have situations where honeybees and native bees complement one another and, pr and produce um, better fruits, um, better fruit quality, or, or um, better shelf life, better nutrition. Um, so uh, this is not, um, this is a finding that is generalizable. We've come together as a group of scientists around the world, um, brought many data sets together, and, and we found that uh, even when we bring honeybees to the farm fields, there's something additional that the wild pollinators are providing. And uh, thus, again, it's important to have both of these in our cropping systems. So how do we get them in our cropping systems? Well, Kate also mentioned some of the many threats that are affecting our wild pollinators today. And one of them is the um, simplification of agricultural landscapes and the chemical intensification of those landscapes that tends to accompany that. So this is a big field of sunflower. It provides uh, it's a very good uh, source of pollen and nectar. It provides a lot of resources for our, um, our native pollinators, um, but only for a brief moment, because when those uh, crops um, are, are finished uh, or when they're harvested, then there are no more resources. And um, at the same time, these crops uh, sort of lay out a big feast for pest insects that may come along. And so in order to control those pests, they heavily use pesticides, which of course um, can target, can um, influence non-target uh, insects as well, like our pollinators. Um, so these trends towards simplification and chemical intensification are things that we're seeing around the world. And this is something that we really need to think about when we're thinking about maintaining pollinators. But we can reverse these trends and we can create what's called a biologically diversified farming system. I want to focus on three different levels within this biologically diversified farming system. First, we have the surrounding landscape. So we have um, what's around the farm. And when we can include different types of agriculture as well as different um, uh, some natural habitat patches, then we have a more complex and heterogeneous landscape that has been found to be beneficial for our wild pollinators. And then on the farm field uh, itself, uh, we can have, um, farmers can introduce floral resources in the form of uh, crop borders like hedgerows or um, flowering uh, grassy margins. Uh, and we can have a, more, a greater diversity of crops themselves in the farm field. So I'll talk about each of those levels. Starting with the natural habitat patches in the surrounding landscape. Um, this is an example from California where we find that on farms that are close to natural habitat, that we find a diversity of insect pollinators visiting almonds, an important crop in the region. But when we're on, and on farms that have no nearby natural habitat, uh, we only find uh, what has been brought to the farm, which is the honeybee. Um, and we also find a doubling of crop production um, on the farms that have this diverse and abundant 
native bee and native insect community compared to the farms that just have the honeybees. Um, and this is generalizable because uh, now bringing together lots of different studies around the world, we find that landscape complexity leads to these more diverse uh, and abundant pollinator communities, leads to improved pollination and increased yield. This is an argument for habitat conservation in the surrounding landscape. But unfortunately, if you're, in a, a, if you're a farmer whose farm is not near a natural habitat, that um, information doesn't really help you. So what else can farmers do? Um, here's where they do have agency is to place um, some of these flower strips uh, in, on their own farm, such as hedgerows. So again, uh, from our research in California, uh, we've looked at these hedgerows, um, hedgerow plantings over the long term, and we found that they're extremely uh, good for conserving wild pollinators. They really help to bring back uh, the abundance and the diversity of those groups. Again, this is generalizable. Um, a number of different systems around the world have been studied and have found this. But what is not generalizable is the effect that this has on uh, actual crop yields. Uh, in fact, we find, um, if you look at the red line, the, the solid red line there, that the pollination services provided um, when you add a hedgerow or other flower border to the field, they drop off rapidly into the field. Um, and uh, so, so the, the positive effects don't extend that far in. Uh, and that uh, there's still not a huge number of studies, but there's a huge amount of variability in those studies. So while some do show improvements um, in yield when you add a flower strip, others do not. So uh, when you think about it, there's these vast, vast fields out there. As I mentioned, uh, we have this trend towards large, simplified fields. And in this case, border plantings alone are not enough. And that's the reason why we need to consider this third level of getting into the farm field itself and thinking about different crops that flower at different times, providing different resources and thus better habitat for um, the, the pollinators, but also um, pr uh, producing less demand at a single time for pollination services, and thus uh, the native insects, again, can provide more of that service. So comparing monoculture and polyculture plantings, uh, here we have a, a monoculture squash field on the left and a polyculture field on the right. There are very, very few studies. Only a couple actually have been done specifically on this. Um, but in those that have been done, again, we're finding that these polyculture farms do support um, a greater diversity and abundance of wild pollinators again. So, and finally, there's evidence that exists. And this is, this is again, global evidence because bringing a lot of different studies together there's evidence that these different effects build upon one another. In other words, they can add to one another, or they can even interact in a positive way. So these three different elements of a biologically diversified farming system, the crop itself, the borders around the crop field, and the complex uh, landscape surrounding the field, the natural habitat patches, are all important factors promoting crop pollinators, and pollination services. And an interesting thing is that there also, um, there's also evidence for all of these three elements in um, adding to natural pest control, which can allow farmers to reduce their uh, use of pesticides. And that, of course, is also important for helping us keep our native pollinators in our environment. So some take-home points for USAID. Um, providing a diversity of pollinating insects is important for crop production, food security, and livelihoods, as we'll hear more about uh, presently. And it provides this insurance policy relative to relying on managed honeybees alone. Uh, both small and large farmers can benefit greatly from enhanced pollination by using these kind of diversification techniques that I've been mentioning that promote pollinators and also reduce the need for pesticides. And when pesticide need is reduced, then that means more money in the farmer's pockets as well because pesticides are expensive. These methods include diversifying crops through polyculture and rotation, planting flower borders, and maintaining patches of natural habitat. 
And um, I mentioned the co-benefit of reducing the need for pesticides, but in fact, there are many other co-benefits that have been well documented, which include soil fertility, pest and disease control, flood and erosion control, water quality, carbon storage, and enhanced biodiversity. So let's let the pollinator show us the way to a sustainable agriculture by, suppo by supporting diversified farming practices. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now hand it over to our next speaker. Dr. Taylor? Please up next. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Hello, everybody. I would like to thank the USAID for this invitation, and I'm honored to be a part of this panel. I'm Smita Krishnan. I'm a scientist from the Alliance of Biodiversity International Land Sea Act. The study that I would be presenting is a small section of a review prepared in collaboration with the FAO. I would like to thank Gabby and Chris for their contribution towards making this presentation interesting, and thank you all for being here today. The main aim of the study was to identify the associations between forest management practices, landscape management, and pollination services. Today, I will very briefly summarize the findings and will use two case studies to explain the link between forest, landscape management, and pollination services. Based on the review, the main drivers were categorized into three sections forest management practices, habitat modification, and climate change. The forest management practices that influence pollinator abundance and diversity were logging, deadwood retention, fire, grazing and mowing, and restoration. All these practices modify available resources such as forage, nesting sites, host plants, all of which directly affect pollinator communities. The second driver that influences pollinators is habitat modification. Land use change and land management practices can fragment and degrade pollinator habitats. And this could affect habitat connectivity and thus affect their populations. The third driver, climate change, could alter time, quality, and duration of phenological events in plants as well as in animals. For example, if there is a mismatch in the time of emergence of a pollinator, that is from larval to adult stages, and availability of forage resources that it requires, the survival of the species will be threatened. Uh, rain shifts could further complicate the situation. Today, I would be presenting two case studies that are linked to habitat modification. The first case study is about Brazil nut trees from Peru. Uh, Brazil nut is regarded as one of the most important non-timber forest products in the Western Amazon, not only really because of its high economic value and significant contribution to the GDP of the producing country, but also due to its importance for local livelihoods as it is a main source of income. As it is harvested almost entirely from the wild, it can also play an important role in sustainable management of forests. Being a cross-pollinated species, transfer of pollen from one tree to another is required to set fruit. The tree mainly depends on animal-mediated poll animal pollination, uh, specifically large-bodied bees, such as Xylocopa shown in this picture. The anatomy of the flower is such that only large-bodied bees can reach the nectar, and in the process, the bee is covered in pollen. Any impact of the pollinator population could directly impact the food production and eventually the population of Brazil nut trees. Although most species that pollinate Brazil nut trees can fly over large distances, the quality of the habitat could impact the behavior of the pollinator. To better know how landscape context may influence state 
of Brazilian genetic resources, the study compared the pollen mediated gene flow across the gradient of uh, degradation. The study region has been subject to several human activities such as mining, logging, and agricultural expansion, all of which leads to degradation of Brazil nut habitats. The most degraded was where the forests were converted for agriculture with retention of only Brazil nut trees, and the least degraded were, of course, protected forests. The results showed that Brazil nut seedlings consistently had lower genetic diversity and higher inbreeding than adults, which was significantly associated with the extent of forest degradation. The example here is the least degraded scenario to the most degraded scenario. And we noticed that the way the pollinator behaves has considerably changed. The findings indicate that due to significant changes in the structure and composition of Brazil nut tree habitats, which can be attributed to the removal of trees and alteration of the understory, led to restricted movement of pollinators. In addition to the unfavorable matrix habitat, fewer nesting locations also impacted the pollinator population, because this pollinator mainly nests in dead wood. Evidence here suggests, shows that importance of reproductive landscape connectivity, it is important to conserve diverse areas and support sustainable selective logging as an alternative to land conversion to support the viability and productivity of this species. The second case study is about pollinators of coffee from India. Coffee is an extremely important commercial crop. And Coffea canifora, known as Robusta coffee, is a cross-pollinated species, and that's the species I will be talking about today. Although Robusta is mainly when pollinated, bees considerably enhance fruit set. And in India, social bees were the main pollinators, among which Apis dorsata, a wild honey bee, is the main pollinator of coffee. The study was carried out in a landscape where a large proportion of the landscape is covered by forests which is seen in dark green and orange on the eastern and western sides of the study region. The light green and white in the middle comprise of a coffee paddy matrix, and within this matrix are many forest remnants. There is one forest for every three square kilometers, and Apis dorsata, the main pollinator of coffee, nests in such forest remnants. Traditionally, coffee is cultivated by clearing the forest understory and retaining the canopy trees for shade. Usually, the canopy tree species composition in coffee agroforests is very similar to the tree species composition of original remnant forest that is present within the landscape. Coffee usually masks flowers within the landscape after the first summer showers and thus requires a large force of pollinators which is often provided by Apis dorsata colonies. These bees are migratory in nature, and they have a very high nesting fidelity. That is, they nest on the same trees every year. One of the questions that we addressed was, what are the local and landscape variables that influence density of bee colonies and forests? The size of the forest fragment was the most important variable that influenced Apis dorsata colony abundance. The colony abundance was disproportionately high in fragments located in landscapes with a high proportion of forest fragments and coffee agroforests. In other words, they preferred to nest in large forests surrounded by a coffee forest matrix rather than a paddy matrix habitat as depicted in this picture. This indicates that while they nest in forest fragments, they access floral resources from both forests and coffee agroforests. As I mentioned earlier, Apis dorsata is a migratory species and stays within the coffee landscape between January and June. In this graph, the red line is the number of Apis dorsata colonies. The green is the density of bee pollinated shade trees and flower. The yellow is the number of species of bee pollinated shade trees and flower. The bee migrates into the landscape to benefit from the floral resources that the shade trees and forests provide and coffee just happens to flower during this time frame and benefits from the pollination services of Apis dorsata. 
These two studies consistently demonstrate the need for well-connected pollinator corridors to facilitate the survival of pollinator communities to benefit from their services. As you all know, close to 90% of all wild flowering plants depend on pollinators for fruit set, and hence pollinators are extremely important for the resilience of forests. Forests provide a wide range of ecosystem services such as pollination services, pest control, water, climate mitigation, genetic resources, all of which directly impact our food production. Hence, forest and landscape management is extremely relevant in the context of our food security. I would like to thank Gabby and Fiddle for sharing their slides on Resilnut. I would like to thank the FAO and the FTA program of the CGIAR for the funding. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Smitha. Uh, we are going to pause right now. If we have any sort of clarifying questions folks have for both Claire or Smitha, um, one such question um, from Colin Van Buren. Uh, the point about native pollinators doubling crop production was super great as an example of how increased uh, functional diversity uh, increases ecosystem function. I wonder if we know how declines in pollinators in the United States or elsewhere has affected crop production. Do we have an estimate of how productive we'd be now if pollinator systems were still healthy? Yeah, I can take a stab at that. Um, there is some, I, I think um, actually Taylor may be able to better address this. There's a national study um, that Taylor was uh, the senior author on that looks at the whole U.S. Um, in terms of the economic value of pollinators. Um, um, we also did a study in California about the economic value of pollinators, uh, of na native pollinators. And it was framed a little bit differently. It's framed more like what is happening to these native pollinators and how important are they currently. Uh, in the California study, we found that about 40% of what um, what we attribute the, the the total economic value of pollinators is actually coming from the native pollinators. Maybe I'll pass it to Taylor to uh, to fill in on that. Yeah, so I think I've unmuted myself. Um, yeah, that's a great question. The study that Claire is talking about, I think, was in the Q and A chat too. It's a uh, national study about the decline of uh, wild native pollinators, but that's not exactly the question. I think the question was um, uh, how much more could we produce if we had full pollination um, compared to what we have now? Like if we rebuilt pollinator communities back to their full strength and got 100% effective pollination of our crops. And that's the sort of crop by crop answer, but a lot of the studies that I do and that Claire does and others actually ask exactly that question by artificially adding pollen and, and finding out what full production would look like. Um, in coffee where I've done that, the difference is about 20 or 25 percent. In other uh, crops it's 100 percent because uh, pollinators are uh, really, really low and really, really required. So. I don't know if anybody summed it all up into a production, um, but I will put a couple um, references and links in the chat about that uh, when I track them down. Okay, thank you. Um, if we have no other questions, clarifying questions, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Taylor Ricketts. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's a delight to be here. I've already learned a lot from the first two talks. Um, what I'd like to do is zero in on the role of pollinators in global nutrition, per se, um, uh, to complement uh, the great talks by Claire and Smith about um, the importance of pollinators generally and the effect of land use management on them in our working landscapes. And so this is what I really mean by that. This series of boxes across the top in blue, I think, are how we think about how changes in ecosystems wind up changing farmer incomes. Ecosystems change in that left-hand box. 
changing pollinators as the two previous speakers showed us, changing the service of crop pollination to our crops, which changes the yields of those crops, coffee, Brazil nut, and other things, and wind up changing revenue and money for farmers. So that's the classic thing. What I want to do is take that red path a little bit below and talk about how differences or changes in crop pollination also can adjust nutrients in our diet and therefore um, improve nutrients in our diet and therefore reduce disease. So a second value from pollination, aside from economic, uh, focus more on nutrition and health. So pollinated crops do this, and pollinators do this, because a lot of crops supply micronutrients to our diet. So everything on the left-hand side of that black line there are foods that are importantly dependent on crop pollinators and supply important levels of micronutrients to our diet. Things like vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K, folate, iron, and so forth. So I want to contrast that to the stuff on the right and make sure it's clear that some plants don't require pollination at all. Staple grains like wheat and rice do not. Other starches like sweet potatoes and potatoes do not. Leafy greens do not. So it's not everything in our diets. It's not even the bulk of the calories which come from cereal grains like rice and wheat, but it's what gives our diet diversity and variety and supplies all these micronutrients. So micronutrient deficiencies are a big deal, even if you are getting enough calories. It's called the hidden hunger by many. It affects about 25% of people on Earth, and it um, uh, has effects like anemia and scurvy and other diseases. It leads to blindness, lower IQ, stunting, lost productivity, and it makes a lot of other diseases worse. The death rates for other diseases higher. So it's an enormous contributor to global burden of disease. Again, even if people are getting enough bulk calories. Here's a graph from um, Eilers of about 10 years ago, um, just showing for a bunch of different vitamins on the bottom there, how much is thanks to pollinators. And I want you to look at the hatched part of each um, bar here. That's the part that of the global production of each vitamin, in this case, that came from animal pollinated plants. So I've just labeled a couple. Vitamin E, very little comes from animal pollinated plants. Vitamin A, about half does. Lycopene, which is in tomatoes and other things, antioxidant, about half. So we can see that overall our supply of these nutrients is thanks to pollinators often in a kind of global survey kind of way. This is a paper that Claire Kremen was on, by the way. We can also get a little better than that and map it. So this is a study led by Becky Chaplin Kramer at Stanford, who took those kind of bulk global data and mapped them. So each map, let's look at the vitamin A1 on the left. Each map shows what fraction of the local production of vitamin A through all the crops that give it to us um, are dependent on pollinators. So the red areas are where up to almost half of the vitamin A is coming from pollinated plants, or plants that depend on animal pollinators to produce the crop that we eat and get vitamin A from. Same thing for iron, same thing for folate in the other two uh, panels. You can see that overall vitamin A has a much higher dependence. Its red bar goes way higher, almost to 0.5, where the other ones are slight. But there are places where there's a high uh, pollination dependence of our micronutrient supplies and places that are not so dependent, right? So we can figure out maybe where spots of concern might be. So these two studies I just showed you talk about the potential dependence, the kind of aggregate production, how big a problem could this be? But to really figure out how much to worry, I think we need to know how much people are actually getting, and that depends on what they eat. So what are they getting these nutrients from? What is their diet from which foods? And are they getting enough? If they're getting three times as much as they need, a decline won't matter so much. But if they're right on the edge of sufficiency, then a decline from pollinator decline might be a big problem. So in my view, we need to work a little bit harder to get to this, the demand side, the, the eaters, the consumers of food, to see um, what actually is coming into their bodies through their diets. So the last study I wanted to spend a little more time on than the other two is trying to do this. And this was led by Alicia Ellis, fantastic postdoc researcher um, a few years ago here at 
uh, University of Vermont, and she asked exactly this question by working with Harvest Plus, which does diet recall surveys all over the world. And she found uh, 10 sites in four countries by working with them in Bangladesh, Mozambique, Uganda, and Zambia, where she could get diet recall surveys, where people would write down what they ate every 24 hours. And she was able to estimate their actual intake of five different nutrients, which you can see there on the left, every day, multiple days, person by person. So this purple little table shows, you know, the top row is individual number one, a person, and they reported they ate 10 grams of mango, and she can calculate that's giving them 3.5 units of vitamin A. That's just a standard unit of vitamin A, and so forth, right? So she can take their diet and calculate how much micronutrient they're getting. And what she did with this is create this curve. So this bell curve type thing is just the population of one of these communities. And so some people are getting not very much, some people are getting a lot. That vertical line is a requirement, um, which means if you get more than that, if you're to the right of that vertical dotted line, you're probably getting sufficient intake of that nutrient. Okay? Um, this is Zambia with vitamin A as an example. Everything to the left of that line, in other words, that blue shaded area, is the proportion of the people in that population that are at risk. They're not getting enough. And um, those are the people we worry about. Okay, so this is what she can create with those data. And then she can remove pollinators, essentially. And what that does is remove pollinated foods from people's diets. This is all in a model. Not She's not actually removing foods, but she can ask what happens if pollinators decline and the foods they pollinate are no longer as big a part of people's diets. And I hope what you can see is that on the right now, that whole curve has moved to the left and the blue area is bigger. That means more people are at risk than were before. So this is kind of the intuition of what she can do with these um, survey data. And here's kind of the take home message. So for the four countries across the top, um, we can ask, I'm just showing you for two of the most important ones, vitamin A and folate, um, how many people were newly at risk with pollinators um, removed from the picture? And so, for instance, in Mozambique, vitamin A, 56% of the population became newly at risk for vitamin A deficiency with pollinators gone. Uganda, 15% of the population became newly uh, at risk. For folate, only in Mozambique was it significant, and that's 23. So big changes in some countries for some nutrients, but also important to see not so big changes in other countries for other nutrients. So the value of looking more detailed is it's not a universal risk by country or by nutrient. Okay, so what does this all mean? I think the first thing it means is pollinator loss can have really big health impacts, even if some of those numbers weren't that big in some of those cells in just the last slide. So for vitamin A alone, um, it, about 800,000 people a year die because of vitamin A deficiency. So even if nothing else mattered, that's a health problem we should be um, worried about. And a lot of vitamin A comes from pollinated plants around the world. Vitamin A deficiency leads to blindness and stunting, infertility, and it increases the death rate for a lot of other diseases like measles and anemia and diarrhea. So it's a big deal. Folate, I'm, I bet you know, is mostly about pregnancy risk, premature, and low weight pregnancies. So the two that we're finding changes for are already a big deal. But it's also important to know that not all populations are equally at risk. It really depends on the diet not just the aggregate production, what people are eating. And I think we can sort of posit that the more vulnerable populations are those whose nutrient sources depend on pollinators, mostly. Um, populations that have many people close to the threshold, such that a disturbance like removed pollinators will move people across that line into risk. And people that are less able to substitute with other plants or with dietary supplements, um, pills, and so forth to get their nutrients. Okay, right here at the end, the things I want you to remember from my part of the talk are pollinators are really important to nutrition. They're not important everywhere all the time, 
we can figure out where. We've learned how to identify where the risks really are most um, concerning. And I think this is one example of many of how biodiversity can underpin and does underpin food security and human health worldwide. So with that, I'll wrap up. Say thanks to these people who support our work, and I'd love to hear from you if you want to get in touch. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Taylor. And thank you to our other speakers, uh, Claire and Smitha. Uh, we are now opening it up to the audience for questions. We've been capturing those in the chat box. Uh, there's been a rich discussion uh, going on, and we've also been um, you know, answering some of the questions in the chat box as well. And so with that, I will ask a question from uh, Emily Hirata uh, for Taylor. Have there been any studies in low to middle income countries that show reduced malnutrition rates, so less uh, MAM or SAM uh, with increased pollinator levels? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think what the person's asking is not just are intakes declining or would they decline, but have we actually shown um, uh, malnutrition and its health effects um, decrease as pollinators rise or increase as pollinators drop? And I think, as far as I know, no. I have not seen a field study that actually measures health outcomes compares them to changing pollinators and really nails it in that sense. Um, I feel like we're really just sort of uh, groping our way into this part of the importance of pollinators. And the study you described, if I summarized it right, is sort of the thing that we'd all like to get to um, to really show and understand this relationship. So sorry if I misunderstood, but if I did, that's the, that's the answer. Excellent. Thank you. And if, Emily, you're looking for clarification, please you can um, shoot your answer into the, the chat box. Um, with that, I have a question for all three of our presenters from John Porterfield. It goes, uh, relationship of pesticide use and pollinators. Do, you, do we know the role pollinators may play in offsetting the damages of insect pests? Also, do we know the benefit of precision placement of insecticides in maintaining adequate pollinator services? I can try and take a stab at the first part. Um, I, I didn't understand the question at first when I saw it in the chat, but I think what the question is asking is, um, can if pests are damaging a crop and reducing its yield, can pollinators uh, offset that by increasing the yield? Um, and that is a, that's a really interesting question. I don't have figures to provide on that uh, because I don't. Again, I don't think we've quite looked at it in that way. Um, one of the one of the issues might be sometimes it's going to be quite an indirect relationship and would have to be studied really carefully. For example, if the pests are affecting the vegetative part of the crop, but the crop is actually a fruit that pollinators um, are increasing yields on, then there could be these two different effects happening at the same time. Um, and it's, it's a little hard to know how that would play out. There can be other cases where the pest is actually affecting the pollinated product. Um, we have that case, for example, in a crop I studied strawberry, where we have a pest, um, a ligus bug, that is reducing not really the yield of the crop, but it's reducing the desirability of the crop. And at the same time, um, if we don't have enough pollinators, that would also reduce the desirability of the crop, because in both cases, it makes the strawberry kind of all crumpled up looking. Um, so again, I'm not really answering your question in any kind of global way, uh, but I do think that, that that there probably are cases where improved pollination could offset the losses due to pests. Um, but then you come to the pesticide issue. So 
when people are using a lot of pesticides to get rid of the pests, then they also can be having negative effects on the pollinators. Um, you asked about more targeted or precision use of pesticides. Um, and the, the targeted or more pre precision use of pesticides, one, one example of that is the neonicotinoid pesticides are kind of called more targeted, um, but they actually have quite negative effects on pollinators as well. So we have to be very careful, uh, even when people talk about more targeted uses. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to have slower effects onto pollinator communities. Thank you, Claire. Uh, any other comments from Smitha or Taylor? I think Claire has covered it. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. That was a great answer. Excellent. Uh, I will go to another question, um, potentially for all three uh, of our speakers, um, from Gunrun Run, uh, Stockhemp. Uh, hold on. What type of questions would anal analyze a head of program design be asking to understand the pollinator situation? What type of questions should analyses a head of program design be asking to understand pollinator situation. I'm asking this quite plainly because I don't know much about it and I'm hoping there might be already um, some standard assessment questions that others could copy, paste, um, and use. I'm asking with a, from a strong nutrition interest angle. I can try to start that one. I really love this one. It's a good question and sort of like how do I move forward with this. Um, I think one of the first uh, things to do is just survey the crops that are important parts of diet or important economic parts of the economy in whatever region you are. And then you can look up against a well-known list of how dependent on pollinators each one is. And increasingly we know who the pollinators are for each one as this global community that Claire mentioned uh, keeps doing research and keeps sharing it with each other. So the first kind of step I would um, go to is which are the economic and which are the um, diet important uh, crops in my region. I distinguish those because some things you grow like coffee that aren't so sustaining but are really important economically. Um, then you get a sense for what the problem is. And then I step two I think is just to see um, uh, which bees are coming and that's remarkably easy science to do just to watch flowers when they're open and record which bees are coming. And then you have a sense for um, how many and how often, um, kind of a initial sense for what kind of adequate pollination uh, you're getting. So those are uh, two things. And then on the kind of how to help pollinators, it's pretty simple what pollinators need, I think. And Claire and Smith have both went into this. They need food, which is flowers throughout their flight season. They need housing, which is different for different bees, but it's soil or holes in trees or holes in reeds or things like that, depending on the species. And they need to be protected from pesticides, so not actively poisoned. Um, and those are all things that are in the control of not only regional um, managers or decision makers, but individual farmers. So unlike a lot of problems that require global collective action like climate change and things, this one actually is pretty straightforward to do your part in helping. So that's like the beginning of an answer of how to understand how big a deal it is where you are and how to think about what you can do to help. Um, Smitha or Claire, do you have yeah, on the experimental level, probably um, it is good. To, it would be good to compare between an ex, uh, you know, have an exclusion pollinator exclusion experiment and compare the uh, open pollinated and uh, uh, the pollinated ex excluded uh, treatment 
to see what is the contribution of the pollinator. Thank you, Smitha. Uh, and unless, Claire, do you have uh, further comments, I will go to the next question, which actually I will direct to you. Is um, from Javier uh, Chaparro. Uh, will the significant use of honeybees impact, negatively impact the population of native wild bees in the same area? Yeah, um, this is something where, again, there's sort of different answers depending on where it's been studied that, you know, we do sometimes find competition effects between honeybees and native bees. Um, a lot is going to depend on the details. It's going to depend on how many floral resources are in the area, how many native bees are, sorry, how many honeybee colonies we're talking about. Um, definitely, it, it can be an issue. Um, and I think it's, again, we, we kind of need both of these kinds of ways of pollinating in our crop system. So uh, it, it's not like I think any of us are saying don't use managed pollinators, but just be sensitive about the importance of, of having both in the environment. Um, and a lot of the things that, uh, well, at least in, in my talk, what I was recommending are ways of getting those floral resources back into landscapes where they've been diminished. And this is going to help both the native pollinators and the honeybees, because the honeybees also need the suite of resources. It's really important that you have floral resources across the time period where when these organisms are out and about and flying around and, and gathering these resources. So they need to have um, you know, a diverse set of, of plants that they like at um, across, you know, across the warm season, um, or if you're in the tropics, across pretty much the entire year. Um, so I think that, you know, when you think about trying to have both in the environment, it means not overemphasizing one or the other, and it means trying to provide for the habitat needs of, of both of those groups. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Smitha from uh, Virginia, <laughs> sorry, our Q&A kind of jumps around on me, uh, from Virginia Zonbrecher, is there any evidence on the impact of climate change on pollinator populations, positive or negative? Uh, there is an example from uh, Bonio regarding um, the uh, fig insects. So the emergence of uh, uh, figs require uh, the fig wasps to pollinate the figs. But when they are uh, in Borneo, there is an example which shows that there has been a local um, extinction of uh, fig wasps because the emergence of the time of the emergence of fig wasps and the time when uh, the availability of floral resources, the figs which are in flower, uh, did not synchronize due to a uh, uh, El Nino effect which led to drought. And the flowering of figs did not happen during that particular year led to a local extinction of fig insects. Uh, this is one example that I can think of right Thank you, Smitha. Uh, for the next question for all of our speakers is, you know, uh, from Alan Gilbert, are there studies that propose adjustments in pollinator habitat and populations that might accommodate the effects of climate change in specific locations? Noting we've had a number of resources shared throughout uh, the webinar in the chat box, um, many links to um, articles, um, publications. But for particular studies uh, around that, do the presenters have any
So I can start. This is Taylor, <clears throat> um, and it picks up on a little bit uh, Smitho's talk and some of the answers Claire's been giving in the chat. I think the kind of general answer to that is um, uh, to kind of anticipate what the effects of climate change are likely to be where you are. So are you likely to see temperatures rising, precipitation getting more seasonal or more or less, and then map that against the needs of your most important pollinators. So it's difficult to have a general question. I guess the one general, um, sorry, general answer, I guess the one general answer I would say is if, if we think that climate change will begin moving species around, in other words, where they like to live will not be where they live now, <clears throat> as temperatures get too hot for them there, or they have to move north or up to stay where they like the climate, then we need to facilitate that movement and have um, networks of habitat stopover places for them to migrate over generations, over years, to keep pace with the changing um, climate niche that they might need. So um, the impacts of climate change, just to add to Smith's answer, that I've seen most convincingly are about range shifts in bees. There's pretty strong evidence now that bees are moving toward the poles and moving uphill in their ranges, and I'll put that paper in the chat. So one thing to do is to facilitate that by making sure we haven't removed all kind of stepping stones for migration for them to move slowly over years as climate changes. The other thing, though, is like I started saying, if it's going to get much, much wetter, make sure there are dry areas for them to still nest so they don't get slumped out in their nests. If it's going to get much hotter, maybe there are ways to provide shade in agroforestry systems. So it gets pretty specific after that general answer, which is facilitate connectivity and movement. Smitha or Claire, do you have anything to add? If not? Um, I could add just one thing, but it, this might be just a slightly different interpretation of the question. Um, but I think, again, looking at those synergies, uh, you know, when we, when we go for these more diversified farming systems, they do provide a, a, a multiplicity of benefits. Um, so when we're, you know, doing things like adding uh, keeping more trees in the landscape uh, that helps to build the connectivity that Taylor was talking about, um, but it also sequesters carbon, um, and it can do a lot of other things like you know preventing soil erosion and doing uh, and hel helping water infiltrate into soils to prevent flooding. Um, similarly, if we have this di very diversified uh, situations on the farm itself, then often we're incorporating more trees onto the farm. We're uh, keeping more cover on the ground all the time, uh, and those kinds of things help to sequester carbon into the soil and into the trees themselves, uh, and, and that, so that helps to do some mitigation um, for climate change. But all of these things, actually these diverse, very diversified farms, are much more, um, they really help with climate adaptation as well for farmers. Uh, growing a diversity of crops can spread risk. Um, and uh, uh, some of these um, same kinds of things that are beneficial for the pollinators, like having crop rotations, for example, having a diversity of crops across time, having a diversity of crops in space, um, can also help with, uh, with drought, creating drought resilience. Um, and anything that you do to build the soil helps the soil build, hold water. Uh, so a lot of these things are, I'm, I'm not being terribly clear, I'm rambling a little bit, I think, but a, a lot of these things kind of come together in creating a more sustainable farm. It's better for the pollinators, and it's also better for climate adaptation and mitigation. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I know we've had a number of questions around uh, pesticides uh, and the impact of pesticides, uh, and Claire has, you know, put a review about uh, pesticides in the chat or in the impact of pesticides on pollinators. 
Um, but I'll follow up with these questions um, we have from Bill Thomas, uh, Alondra, Alondra Ark, and M. Marshak. Uh, Bill's question of how do we support pollinators given the reality of agricultural pesticide use? Uh, and then the follow-up kind of questions around pointing to recent studies, which I'd mentioned Claire had put something in the chat box. Uh, and then also, what is being done with pesticide research to reduce impact on pollinators, uh, to reduce um, and change what is being used? Any thoughts to those questions? Yeah, I can I can uh, take a stab at it. Um, you know, as far as the the pesticides go, I would say that. You know, really, really trying to support the uh, transition towards agroecological methods, um, which, which really emphasize building in natural pest control into our systems. And I think that this is probably, um, you know, particularly relevant in smallholder agriculture. As mentioned before, when we can do that, then it can reduce the need and the dependence of small farmers on purchases of pesticides, which can be really, really expensive. There's some really interesting studies in France, for example, that show, um, going to, not, not to the small ones, but in France, show that uh, actually many farmers overuse pesticides. They spend way more money on pesticides than they need to. Um, so it, it can be a question of beginning to reduce the use of pesticides and also transitioning to uh, farming systems that are building in more of the natural pest control so that we can get away from using them so much. And then that helps with benefiting the pollinators as well. Uh, as far as studies that are identifying pesticides that would be less impactful on pollinators, I, I don't know of any. That doesn't mean they're not out there, but I, I haven't heard of anything like that. Uh, Smitha or Taylor, anything to add around pesticides and pollinators? If not, I'll go to our next question. We have some questions around nutrition. Uh, Emiliano um, Poyutelli, um has a question. Can pollinated crops produce more micronutrient-rich fruits? Uh, which can be what can be the underlying mechanism for this? Perhaps uh, Taylor to start on this one. Yeah, this is a great one, and also I think Claire and people in her group have done some work on this on almonds, um, nutritional quality of almonds. Um, so. Uh, there have been very few to kind of show this. I'm part of two projects now trying to do that, one on blueberry in um, the US and one on coffee in Costa Rica, actually doing pollen limitation experiments, treating different plants differently for the pollen they get, um, and then analyzing not just their yields, but the um, quality and nutrient content. So I don't know the answers from the work we're doing, and I only know of a couple papers who have tried to do that, and I can put those in the chat. But I think it's really pretty early. Um, there have been um, many more studies on sort of the fruit quality, so um, how big, how sweet, um, how consistent, how able to uh, uh, travel well and not kind of rot on the way. Uh, from strawberries and other things, there's evidence that, that pollination improves all those things. Um, I think the mechanism, I'd be guessing, but I think it has to do with resource allocation if it's there. So um, that we do know that plants allocate resources preferentially often to cross-pollinated and well-pollinated fruits and away from those that aren't. Um, and those compounds, be they antioxidants or things like that take energy to produce. So I would imagine fruits would be more packed when the plant can afford to do that, and the plant can afford to do that if it's allocating resources to well-pollinated fruits. So that's 
total mechanism conjecture on my part, but it's biologically really believable to me, which makes studies like this to see if we can measure it um, really interesting. So Smith and Claire may know of studies that I don't know about, but I feel like we're just kind of turning to that exact question, and it's a good, good one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, I mean, Mark, uh, Robert Marzek uh, asks a uh, question directed to Claire, how might we introduce a polyculture, hedgerows, buffers, et cetera, in areas where uh, the tendency is to tear down the habitat, uh, not considered the main crop? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, often, um, often <clears throat> there's a bit of, there's a cost initially to doing to act to, to really changing one's farming practices, uh, and so farmers are reluctant to change farming practices unless they have some assistance with that. And that, that assistance can be in multiple forms. It, it might require an initial um, incentive, like some sort of financial. Um, bridge loan or something like that to make this transition. It might also require um, uh, extension services and and even very targeted research that helps to design the appropriate system for the specific crop and region. Because we again, we in this webinar we've been talking in quite general terms for the uh, uh, for the most part, except for some specific you know the specific case studies that Smith was talking about. But in generally with we've been talking kind of in a very broad way. So to translate this to specific action, we need to know exactly what plants to plant and in what arrangements and that kind of thing. So that can that can take some very targeted work. Um, so really, you know, it needs it needs support to get farmers to make these changes. They need to see it to their advantage. And often that can just take um, some, uh, you know, sort of like a shot in the arm at the beginning. To, to give them the funds that would allow them to make this transition. Thank you, Claire. Um, for our next question, it comes from Diana Tixey. Uh, how can we convince people to help us in the protection of wild bees if it is known that 80% of global pollination is provided by only 2% of bee species? question for any of our speakers. Smith, uh, I just want to make sure you're getting a chance to answer here. If you don't feel like it, I'm happy to, but um, go ahead and start if you want. I'm fine doing it. OK. Um, yeah, so the the 2%, 80% thing is from a um, controversial and well-known study globally that shows, yeah, there's abundant pollinators that seem to do most of the work most places. And this might make it hard to argue for conserving all bees if only a few of them are what's doing the actual economic work for us. The rest are good to have as species, but not exactly providing ecosystem services the way we always claim. And I, I think most of us who do work in the field on this do see that there are abundant species that do, in any given field, in any given year, provide uh, a lot more of the visits, a lot more of the moving pollen around. Um, and that's just true of ecological communities generally. There are typically a couple of really abundant species, and then a bunch of medium abundant, and then some really rare ones. So. That could be true on its face, but I just want to say one and maybe two things of caution about concluding that, that bolster this argument that we need more than just that 2%. And the main argument is that the main pollinator can change year to year in the same field, and the main pollinator can change, can be different in the same year among fields. And again, almost everybody who studies this out in farms has seen that in their study systems, that the abundant species in year one often can decline quite a lot, and some other bee 
species um, has, a, has a good year and is a more abundant one, that one. I definitely saw that when I worked in coffee in Costa Rica. We definitely see it here in Vermont on blueberries. So there is a need for a variety of species that can, in kind of a portfolio effect, um, as they go up and down in abundance, um, take over for the species that were abundant the year before. So that's a, um, a classic thing. Um, I think I'll stop there and see if others want to join, but the, the thing that paper doesn't do, and I think the message is redundancy and multiple species that can pollinate give you a much better stability of pollination because insect po populations go up and down a lot. They're famous for doing that. So having a lot of them around makes uh, the chances go up that you've got abundance in any given field in any given year. I hope that was clear. Uh, Smitha or Claire, anything to add? If not, I will go on to the next question. We'll probably do a couple more questions before we start to wrap things up and have a final comment from uh, Rob Bertram. Uh, our next question comes from Sarah Carlson. There's a lot written about the high cost of healthy diets and how they are prohibitively expensive for poor people around the world. I'm wondering how pollinator deficits might exacerbate this trend. Has this been looked at? I think this is uh, directed at uh, Yep, okay, I can start again. It, um, the sound went out halfway through your question, so I'm finding it in the little question thing so I can read it again. Did you find it or should I, I see it uh, right now? I can ask it again. Yeah, can you ask it again? Oh, okay. No, go ahead and ask it again, because there's I'm floundering here. Yeah, there's a lot written about the high cost of healthy diets and how they are prohibitively expensive for poor people around the world. I'm wondering how pollinator deficits might exacerbate this trend. Has this been looked at? Ah, OK, great question. Sorry to need two readings. Um, so I don't think it's been looked at, but in principle, um, I would think that pollinator declines would exacerbate that for the simple supply-demand reason that uh, insufficient pollinator pollination of these foods that are relative luxuries and also are packed with micronutrients like, say, you know, mango or melon or whatever, um, if you pollinate them less adequately, if they are pollinated less adequately, they'll produce less they'll supply less uh, and likely prices will rise. So that's like a simple in principle answer. Um, it definitely is <clears throat> that logic has been applied not to the nutrition but to the economic part um, in a lot of studies that supply will go down, um, farmers will earn less, uh, um, there'll be you know, shortages in general. I don't think it's been extended all the way to um, the really interesting nutrition and poverty nexus that was the basis of this question, but I think the same logic applies, and it's pretty simple that inadequate pollination, less production, less availability, uh, more scarcity straight up, and also probably higher prices if you can find things. So. That would be a really good thing, like the other question, to actually try to measure directly and see if this kind of logic chain and hypothesis bears out. OK, thank you. Um, final question from John Porterfield. We'll end with something interesting. Uh, there is concern about zoonotic diseases jumping to humans, e.g. COVID-19. Are there risks from close contact with pollinators other than bats, e.g. bees? Is there concern about risk of human diseases jumping to our fellow creatures, including pollinators? Or is the question far too interesting? Uh, 
I can answer, but I feel like I'm talking a lot. Claire Smith, I'd... Okay. I don't think there are direct risks from bees. Bees and people do not share any pathogens as far as, I'm, as far as I know. The reason bats are such freak, for so frequently the sources is they're mammals like we are. And the further away from us in the tree of life you get, the less likely a virus can, can infect us both. So I think bees are pretty far from us and that um, keeps them from being reservoirs of zoonotic disease like bats and sometimes birds are. But what we do <clears throat> on our farms, especially by bringing honeybees in, is a disease jump risk. So there's really amazing stuff now about how viruses can jump from honeybees to native bees and infect them and make them sick. Um, and a couple colleagues of mine here at Vermont are doing exactly that. As essentially, flowers are kind of like doorknobs. Um, if a honeybee visits and a native bee visits later, they can uh, be infected by a virus that's typically known to be a honeybee virus. So it's not from us, but it's from our activities. There are opportunities for um, virus jumps, just like COVID from mammals to us. Um, virus, viruses are jumping from honeybees to natives and wild species. And I think that's enough of a concern because it's kind of associated with us and our activities. I don't think we're at risk, but native bees are. OK. Thank you, Taylor. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, today, Smitha, uh, Claire, and Taylor, for their excellent presentations and um, answers for today's Q&A. With that, we're going to give the floor over to Rob Bertram for some closing remarks. Uh, Rob is the chief scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. He serves as a key advisor on a range of technical and program issues to advance global food security and nutrition. In this role, he leads USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research, technology, and implementation in support of the US government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, Feed the Future. And with that, I welcome Rob. Thanks, Zachary, and good morning, or good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, just to thank uh, you and Kate and Sarah for including me today. And uh, it's really been a pleasure to listen to these great uh, presentations. Uh, I, I thought that my role, in a sense, here was to provide some reflections on uh, how this relates to our work in food security under Feed the Future in particular. And the fact that uh, the speakers talked about uh, productivity, <coughs> excuse me, nutrition and sustainability uh, were, were, helps uh, greatly uh, align uh, the kinds of things we've been discussing this morning with the kinds of things we think about in uh, implementing the Global Food Security Act. Uh, and uh, for those who are not familiar, our, our metrics that guide that work in this area are really reduction of extreme poverty and reduction in child stunting. And then with resilience, uh, also child wasting in a more, but that's a, a little bit different context uh, often from the kinds we're talking about today. Not always. Um, I think one of the things that struck me listening to the speakers was that it sort of depends what we're growing where, um, the degree to which thinking and perhaps acting on pollination is going to be part of what we carry out. So in the beginning, Feed the Future was really targeted at settled agricultural areas, which were perhaps less uh, diverse than many contexts in which USAID works. Um, having said that, I thought it was a really important, and when I say less diverse, I mean in terms of habitat more than in, necessarily in terms of species, although the two go together. I thought Claire's comment, uh, I think it was in the chat, about the fact that so often in the context where we work, you have small fields and patchworks, and you have rows between them, areas that are uncultivated, and, and that's really where uh, a lot of diversity occurs. It's not necessarily at the level of one plot. Uh, it can be in some contexts, but generally uh, less so and more when we, when we zoom out a little bit and look to a, a small area that's being cultivated by multiple farm families, uh, perhaps growing a variety of crops. 
Um, in the early days of Feed the Future, the big emphasis was on major self-pollinated crops, and there were good reasons for that, and still are in many respects. They are also evolving uh, in terms of the, some of the issues we're trying to take into account as, as uh, agro environments and uh, agri agri food systems evolve. So uh, having said that, we see that for poverty reduction, diversification is a really important aspect. And a lot of that often leads us towards horticulture and vegetables in particular, but also other perennials uh, and trees. And there are a few areas of Feed the Future that work at things like cocoa and coffee, where uh, we heard today, you know, you're dealing with a very different kind of environment than what's typically encountered in row crops. Also, I would add to that animal source foods. Those fruits, vegetables, and animal source foods are, are I think, increasing in importance. And they provide both income and nutrition opportunities, uh, but they have a high information content. And clearly, from what we've been discussing today, some of that high information content is about pollination and what, what, what you need to get a good crop set uh, from your tomatoes or whatever uh, melons or whatever crop you're growing. Um, I was thinking a little bit, too, about some of uh, Smith's comments. Um, the one area that I thought could be interesting to, to inquire about was the famous uh, farmer-managed forest regeneration that we saw across the Sahel uh, over the last 20 or 25 years, where when tree tenure changed, we saw uh, trees actually increase. And in other words, uh, habitat for all kinds of insects increase. Also, livestock fodder increased, but also crop productivity increased. So that's the case where perhaps some of the, if we, if we get enough water into some of those systems and we can see diversification out of sorghum and millet and groundnut into fruits and vegetables, so you need the water, you need the market access, but uh, that's a place where, again, uh, paying attention to uh, uh, things like pollination become more important. I'd also say that, generally speaking, the environmental issues are larger overall with those crops. Uh, we know they're higher value. They tend to use higher inputs, including of pesticides. Uh, I, and it, for those in this field, we know environmental safety is a big issue around peri-urban agriculture especially, but it's true in rural areas as well. Um, I was glad that uh, Dr. Muni Muniapan and I think it was Eva Christensen both mentioned that just because a pesticide is a biopesticide doesn't mean it's safe for pollinators. Um, it's really about targeting. And again, that's knowledge content, right? It's also about biological control. Uh, and we've done a tremendous work in that. And so many in our, our Feed the Future Innovation Lab and IPM has is, is just been a world leader in that effort. And, uh, and we continue to think about that with the establishment of the new current and emerging threats to crops innovation lab. Um, so I want to shift a little bit to nutrition, too, and pick up Taylor's uh, great comments. So yes, micronutrient deficiency is a growing focus for us. And if we look at it, it's very, very contiguous with both extreme poverty and child stunting, primarily focused in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And that's, of course, where the bulk of our work in Feed the Future lies. The estimates, um, are, to get the real estimates on that is difficult, but we know that there's so many benefits associated with dietary diversity um, with, with relates, with, uh, and also through biofortification uh, to address those uh, deficiencies that we can see real benefits related to things like child stunting. Um, and of course, this is where the availability affordability at the same time of a more diverse diet, much of it based on horticulture or increasingly based on horticulture and animal source foods, is critical to get the kinds of nutritional benefits, but also the poverty reduction. And I want to just call out here that this, these are not the drivers of a negative dietary transition, right? If we make fruits and vegetables and animal source foods more affordable, uh, we, we benefit all low-income consumers, including those threatened by obesity and other chronic diseases. But productivity is absolutely critical uh, to make that happen, both to give people the incomes, but also to make the products more affordable. 
So the information intensiveness is just absolutely, oh, I see I'm going too long. Okay, information intensiveness is just a critical aspect of this. So the tools we have, digital, for more information about how to control pests and diseases, how to manage pollination, what's, what are best practices in terms of leaving hedgerows and such. Uh, IPM, biocontrol, targeted use of pesticides where we know they're compatible with not likely to harm uh, natural uh, pollinators or natural predators of the pest. Um, and then biotechnology. I hope people keep in view how much of biotechnology is driving, is driven by reducing pesticide use, only targeting the pest. That's a really huge win in this area. We see it happening with this fall armyworm in countries uh, that are being affected now that don't need to use pesticides to control it. So. Um, and then we didn't get to climate change. I know I've gone on too long. Uh, I think this is a place where we're going to be watching all kinds of biotic interactions, including species presence, species, species absence, and, and uh, just a greater awareness of, of the changes that are occurring. So I think I'll stop there, Zachary. I'm sorry if I've gone on too long. But I really it was a great discussion this morning and uh, very timely as we see our work in agriculture, including increasingly move towards a more diversified system. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you for your comment. Uh, again, thank you to all of our speakers for their presentations today. We have put up some polls, so those uh, of you who have stuck around, please take a moment to fill them out. We use this information to improve our webinars going forward. Uh, please know that the presentation has been recorded. Uh, we will post uh, additional resources on AgriLinks of the recording, uh, the transcripts, also the transcript of the chat box. So if you missed any of it, uh, you should be able to capture that there. Um, and also, if you had registered for the event, you will receive an email with links to all of these resources, too. Uh, thank you all very much for your time and your participation and the rich discussion in the chat box. Thanks all to our speakers and our organizers for this great uh, capstone webinar for our AgriLinks Pollinators uh, theme month uh, for uh, November. So thank you all. Have a good day. Um, see you at our next webinar.